reminders and uh, such things. There's a homework that's due today. Um, you get two attempts. If you haven't started, you might be able to get both of your attempts in today. Um, if not, well, if you're done, you're done. Uh, it's entirely multiple choice, and in hindsight, I realized everything is multiple choice. Everything allows every question allows more than one answer right, except one, uh, which was a mistake on my part. Um, you pick the best answer you find for that one question, which is. Uh, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? There's one question which is not uh, more than one answer right, and it gives you radio buttons instead of check boxes. So you can only pick one. So it seems like one out of four things are right. So if you pick the right answer, you get the point. Uh, there is a midterm on class, uh, uh, in class on Thursday, and it's uh, close books, close notes. Uh, just come with a pen and a pencil or whatever you want to write. That's all you need. Uh, it will cover everything that we did in class till Thursday. Um, and uh, just as a, and you know, we'll talk about questions about all of these things uh, afterwards. Just wanted to kind of uh, uh, put something else on your horizon. There's a project milestone that's due March 16th, which is after the spring break. So it could, for all practical purposes, be next decade. But you know, just so that you know, it's there. Uh, all to for that particular submission, you need uh, you need to have one non-dummy submission on can on Kaggle and uh, a one-page report that describes what you did, any sort of descriptive statistics about the data that you found uh, and what your plans are for uh, going ahead. Uh, it's due March 16th, which means that you get like a week or so after the break. In a perfect world, this should not take too long. You can just run the code from your homeworks um, uh, and it should just be fine. Uh, all I want is for you to actually start planning the project and so that at the end of the semester, you don't find that everything has piled up. So I'm kind of staggering all the milestones uh, through the semester. Um, any thoughts, any questions about any of the logistics? Any logistical questions about the midterm? Yeah? Is it also like all multiple choice that's going on campus? No, it's not. It's not all multiple choice. Uh, there will be some multiple choice. There will be some true false type questions, uh, still figuring out the exact mix of these. There will be some questions that are where you just have to write some proof type things. Um, so it's going to be like a mix of a bunch of stuff. Historically, I have been told, and I'm not saying this just to scare you, historically, I've been told that the midterm tends to be surprisingly hard. Um, uh, and you know, yeah, maybe I'm just saying this to scare you. I don't know. Uh, uh, but yes, just so you know. Other questions? So at the end of the last lecture, uh, I ended in like an in between sort of a state where uh, I was halfway through working out uh, a pack bound for three CNFs. Quick show of hand, how many people want me to continue that as opposed to the other option is we just dive into the midterm, like mid semester review of all the things that we've done. How many people want me to complete the, the pack thing, which will take about 10 minutes? Okay, how many want to uh, do a mid semester review? I think there's a slight majority on the second option. So I'm gonna do that. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a shame because I like the other thing, um, but yeah, I, I do realize that you might have questions, and you know, the long, the more time we set aside for that, it's better. So let's dive right in. Um, my plan here is I'm going to go over all the, you know, I, I, I'm going to go over everything that we did in the semester, realizing that it's an act of futility because I'm trying to compress what. Uh, a dozen lectures or 14 lectures into one hour and 10-ish uh, minutes. It's, so at best, what I can do is just go through that sort of a review document that I shared with you on Canvas. Uh, I converted the document into a bunch of slides. So I'll talk about all the stuff that we did. And if you feel like you have questions about this, just raise your hand and we'll talk about, uh, we'll work it through. My hope is to get to the end of that document 
and uh, uh, you know, at some point, I might say we are getting too much into the weeds, and uh, uh, you know, let's move to the move forward because there might be people with questions about something that's going to come next. Okay, that's the, the ground rules for today. So, the goal is to take stock of what we've seen and to clarify any sort of confusions that you may have. And we started off the semester um, primarily focusing on supervised learning. Um, before I you know, stepped into supervised learning, I did mention that there are other kinds of learning protocols out there. In particular, there is uh, unsupervised learning, there's active learning, there's reinforcement learning. And the primary uh, mechanism here is, um, the, the primary difference is the mechanism with which the learner interacts with the data. And by data, I mean, it could be labeled examples or unlabeled examples. Is there a question on Zoom? There's a question, do unmute yourself or you can ask on chat, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so there, there are different learning protocols. For the bulk of the semester, uh, possibly all of it, we'll be focusing on supervised learning. And in supervised learning, we the, we the setup we have is that we imagine that there is a certain hidden function that nature or oracle or whatever you want to call it labels examples with. The goal of learning is to search over the set of functions, a set of functions, to find the best one. And different definitions of the word best give, give us different ways to think about learning. All of these in common, they have the idea of an instant space. An instance space is a set of uh, uh, is a set that contains all possible examples, all possible instances that are inputs to the classifier or the regressor. So these could be you could think of them as documents. You could think of them as uh, you know documents could be instances, images could be instances, videos, or uh, you know if you want uh, other kinds of data, think like you have a snapshot of a day and you want to predict whether the number of bike rentals tomorrow is going to be more or less than today. Uh, and so all the relevant uh, information about bike rentals today and the weather and whatever you can think of will all constitute the instances. Typically, when we talk about instances, we don't talk about just documents or images or bike rentals. We talk about the features that uh, encode these instances. So we convert these instances into some vector space. Uh, for the most part, at least for the beginning of the semester, we'll assume that these in uh, these feature vectors are given to us. You just uh, you know there is some domain expert who thought hard about the problem and invented features. But when we get to the end of the semester, we'll talk about the idea of learning these feature vectors as part of the learning problem. So the one important thing I want you to kind of keep in mind is uh, this sort of a. Uh, matching or a mapping between instances or examples, sometimes they're called, and features, and feature vectors, actually. So the that's the input side of things. On the output side of things, we have labels. Labels are the outputs of the models that we train. If the labels are, um, uh, you know, if the label, the label space contains all the possible labels that the, the model can produce. If the label space contains two things, we call it binary classification. Could be true, false, minus one, one, zero, one, some two things. If it contains some finite number of things, typically more than two, uh, then we call it multi class classification. If the label space is the set of all possible real numbers, we call it regression. regression. But there are other kinds of label spaces that can exist. Label, you can imagine this problem where you're given some input and you're expected to produce, the, your model is expected to produce a labeled graph, which is a complex object. That is a modeling problem and that kind of a thing is called structured prediction. So there are other types of uh, label spaces that exist. For the most part, in all our discussion, we've talked about uh, binary classification. Then there are two other sets that are of interest here. Something called the concept space. The concept space is the set of all functions, both, both these sets, the concept space and the hypothesis space are both sets of functions. The hypothesis space is the set that your learner explores in order to find the true concept. 
the concept space is this sort of an imagined set that nature used to pick the true function. In a perfect world, if the concept space and the hypothesis space are the same, then uh, exhaustively searching the hypothesis space will get you the true function. In the world that we have, remember that the concept space is this set that we do not, we, it's, it's a, it's a uh, sort of a theoretical construct. So it does not, we do not know what nature uses to say, uh, decide on the stock price of something tomorrow, which set of functions it uses. So we don't have access to the concept space. So in practice, of course, the hypothesis space may never contain the true concept. Um, so the, the other thing that I want you to kind of keep in mind is the, the label space defines the kind of classification problem we have. Any questions so far? Any questions on any of these things? This is just terminology. Yes. Please explain um, what, uh, the label space, what are the other kinds of like structure? Uh, so structure uh, prediction involves predicting multiple decisions uh, that interact with each other. Imagine that I need to predict uh, if my output consists not of one bit, but let's say 10 bits, 10 binary decisions. And I have it, uh, I have these sort of a, a higher order interactions between them that says, if the first bit is true, with high probability, the second bit is false. Or maybe something like this. Any of the first three bits are true, so at least one of the next four bits are true. So there are these interactions and some of these interactions are de deterministic and some of them may also be stochastic or at least statistical. So, uh, the, the, that type of a, a, a labeling problem uh, is called a structured prediction. And where it shows up is, uh, suppose I want to uh, convert my uh, input Wikipedia article, for example, into that info box that you get on the side. So the info box consists of many, many decisions that you need to kind of chain together. Or another example could be, suppose I want to take an image of a, uh, of a person and convert it into like a stick figure drawing. There are only few different objects that are in the stick figure drawing, you want to kind of abstract the person into that schematic. Um, so th those kinds of things could be, uh, are called structured prediction. Another sort of a, a prediction task involves ranking, where you, the output does not consist of, you know, of picking a label, but your the input consists of a set of things and the output might be re-ranking them. Turns out that's kind of closely connected to structured prediction also. Another type could be uh, something like a, uh, where the label space has an implicit uh, consists of discrete objects, okay, but th the label space is has some ordering in between them, like a Yelp rating. A one star is closer to a two star than a five star. So by treating it as multi-class, we are implicitly saying one, two, three, four, five are all equally distant from each other. But there are some mistakes that are more tolerable than others. If the ground truth was two stars and you predicted one, that's okay much better than predicting five. So there is an implicit ordering and can you take advantage of this ordering to improve the model? Uh, so the, the, these are the most popular kinds of things. There's also structured regression where you're predicting multiple real numbers together. Imagine that I have a, 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 a robot who's, uh, that consists of multiple joints, like you know, our arms, and you want to pick something up. You have to carefully, you have to predict different rotations and uh, activations of all the motors so that the combined effect is that your hand, the hand goes to the thing that's getting picked up. So all these decisions interact with each other, right? So th that is structured regression. Other questions? Yes, there's a question on Zoom. Could I consider the hypothesis space as a set of testable functions? I don't know what testable means. Uh, so I would consider the hypothesis space as a set of functions that we can algorithmically explore. Uh, maybe that's what you meant. Uh, you can clarify on Zoom if that's not the case while someone else asks other questions. I can't see whether someone's typing on Zoom. So maybe the answer is, Maybe he's typing, so I'll move on and we can come back to this thing. So one of the things that, okay, so the, that, that was the answer. 
So one of the important concepts that we have encountered uh, that kind of pervades machine learning, either explicitly or implicitly, is the idea that we need to restrict the hypothesis base. We cannot search over all possible functions. If you are hoping to search over all possible functions that exist, you are only going to be in one of two really uncomfortable worlds. If the set of functions is finite, then it's going to be super exponentially finite. And if it's infinite, well, it's infinite. You can't search over an infinite set without uh, giving yourself some grief. So one way or another, you are going to be uh, uh, facing a very difficult problem, partly because the number of functions can be so large that any finite data set, which is all we can ever hope to have, will not be sufficient to tell us, allow us to pick any one function. So in other words, the only way in which you might actually be able to learn something is if you are asking if the, if the learner is provided all possible examples. Another problem with searching the set of all possible functions is that data might have noise. Noise can be thought of as a function that kind of changes the input or changes the label. So if you search over all possible functions, then you're also searching over functions that fit the noise, which means you're going to perfectly explain the training data at the risk, at the, at the uh, uh, cost of generalization. And generalization is the only true goal for machine learning. There is no reason to explain the training data because we have the training data. Uh, this is a big difference between how we think about the same sort of concept in statistics in machine learning and in statistics formally. In statistics, we care to explain the data. There's no notion of generalization to future examples. The goal of machine learning is to generalize to future examples. So given that we have to restrict our hypothesis space to a set of functions, we still need to answer a bunch of questions. One of them is what hypothesis space are we going to use? How do you know what set of functions you need to restrict it to? And we've looked at a bunch of toy cases for that. There's another question, which is how do you represent instances? I said there's a typically often there's a one-to-one -one mapping between instances and feature vectors. Well, what are those uh, feature vectors? And of course, there's a question of what learning algorithm we need to use uh, to actually explore the hypothesis space. Questions before we move on, uh, move into decision tree next. Decision trees it is. So we looked at decision trees. This was the first instance of uh, a class of functions that we encountered. And this was the first instance, instance of a learning algorithm. Anytime you encounter a new type of a classifier, the questions that you need to ask are, what is it? How do you define it formally? Uh, what kinds of functions it can express? And how do you make predictions? And then you also have to ask, how do you learn with it? So with decision trees, what are decision trees? It's, uh, they are a hierarchical data structure that can uh, represent any sort of discrete data uh, by partitioning the data along any one dimension or actually any, uh, partitioning the data using tests for, it could be test for a feature or it could be composite test. Question. So that's the thing that you need to think about. How do you make it work for continuous cases? The decision tree itself cannot have continuous features because if you are partitioning along a continuous feature, then you'll have an infinite number of branches coming out. So you need to discretize the data somehow. You need to discretize the feature somehow. Some ways of discretizing the feature could be bucketing the feature, or you could, a more sort of a generalization, since we've talked about linear classifiers, you could also imagine that every test in the decision tree is not a test for a feature, but actually a separate linear classifier itself. So you have linear classifiers are structured as a tree. We have not encountered that in the class, but I'm just letting you know. So one thing that is not, uh, some, something else that you need to always think about when you encounter a new kind of a model is what kinds of functions can it represent? So what kinds of functions can decision trees represent? 
um, in, in, we saw earlier that every Boolean function can be represented as a decision tree. So any discrete function can be represented as a decision tree. Decision trees are as expressive as the set of all possible Boolean functions. Another question for you to think about is how many count being, you should be able to count the number of decision trees that exist for say small features. Uh, it's kind of a, a painful combinatorial exercise, but worth doing. Um, so I spoke about continuous features. There is a, you know, there are a few different heuristics that we discussed in class on identity on kind of discretizing features so that you can convert it into something that the decision tree can work with. And of course, it's not enough to just have a decision tree. You need to know how to make a prediction with it. Given a decision tree and a new example, how do you make predictions with it? Answer is rather simple. You start at the top of the tree. Every node, internal node in the tree, is a question about the instance that you are currently holding. That question has a finite number of answers. Every branch that comes out is one of those options. You take the option that the question answers, you move down. You keep going down, and the leaf is a tree, is a, is a leaf, is a label. And that label is the label that's assigned. So it's like playing 20 questions if you play 20 questions. So one thing that you should kind of internalize very uh, uh, strongly is the idea that. For any finite data set that is not complete, by that I mean for any finite data set where the number of examples you have is less than the number of all possible examples there might be for that particular set of features. Then for such a data set, the number of decision trees that perfectly agrees with that data is more than one. There can be many decision trees that perfectly agree with the same data set. You should think about why that's the case. One way of thinking about it is you have, you imagine that you pick different root nodes. Every choice of a root node is going to give you a different decision tree. Some of those different decision trees might be functionally identical. They might produce the same label for every example that exists, even ones that are not seen. But some of those decision trees may be functionally different. So there are structurally many different decision trees and functionally also there may be different decision trees. Question. Or if you're asking that, we may ask these now, ones that look different or functions may for example a complete tree. Uh -huh. If we if it, they are first of all output, it's kind of always the same output for the way that the trees are going to be communicated. Yes. So let's take a let, let's uh, do a tiny little uh, example just because I think that's an interesting question worth thinking about. So imagine that you have the function, uh, I'm just going to make up a tree rather than making up a function. Let's say I have a label A. It takes two values, yes and no. When A is yes, you have, let's say I have a B, and this also takes two values. And let's say this is plus, minus, and this is a minus. So this function, by the way, is uh, A and B. When A is yes and B is yes, the label is yes. Otherwise, the labels are no. I could also write the same function as checking with B first. And let's say I put a yes this side this time. And then I check the A. I'm just being deliberately chaotic here. These trees look different from each other, but they are functionally identical. So the question was what? So if you have to count, I would say count, I, I would count the number of structurally different ones. The functional, uh, these two trees are both the same and counting for that is a little bit harder. Uh, I'll give you another example of a tree that is also identical to this, which is, it's a full tree. And you know you are there is a needless check for this feature B when both outcomes are plus. It's not necessary to do it. It's not like the tree is going to if you implement this tree, your code will crash. It's just wasteful and kind of pointless. But I would suggest don't do that. But the tree. So these are all functionally identical but structurally different. And so I I, I think counting the number of functionally identical trees, uh, different trees, is much harder. 
Other question? Yes. Uh, so you're saying before that this is only the case if the number of like unique training examples is less than like the number of yes. possible yes. So if you have like there's only one tree that could cover like all of like training examples. Good question. So imagine that you have let's take this these uh, this data here and Let's say that I'm going to make this much smaller. So imagine that my training data looks like this. Say yes, yes is a plus. Let's call this a Y. Ugh. Can't use a Y. Yes, no is a minus, and no, yes is a minus. Okay, so I have only three of the four possible cases. Now, with these three, I can write more trees than just the conjunction because I do not know what the label for the fourth row is. I can have a tree that predicts the fourth row as a plus. I can have trees that predict the fourth row as a minus. So there are at least two different functionally different trees that agrees with the data. But in terms of structurally different trees, there are numerous ones. For example, this tree, I think, agrees with the data. Uh, maybe this one also agrees with the data. This one probably, actually, they all agree with the data, right? But I could draw other trees that also agree with the data. So in particular, I could have A the plus. No. So when both are plus, I have a plus. When um, ah, yes, sorry. We don't have this, right? So let's say I put a plus here. Okay, there is another tree basically that corresponds to this particular thing. Ah, yes, I know exactly what it is. This tree agrees with the data perfectly. It just makes a commitment that when both are no, the label is a plus. Whereas here, when both are no, the label is a minus. When in this case, you don't even check the other one. In this case also, you don't check the other one. So the, the point I was making is if the number of examples you have is less than the number of all possible feature combinations, then there will be different multiple functions that perfectly agree with the observation. If you have all possible functions, all possible rows in the data table, there will be exactly one function that agrees with the data, but there may be still multiple structurally different trees that represent the same function. Right? So counting the number of functionally different trees, in this case, I was able to do the count very easily because I know that, oh, by the way, I take it back. It's actually pretty easy to count. So if I have this, I don't know what goes here. I have only two options. There are only two functionally different trees. So looking at what is missing and uh, counting the possible combinations gives you the number of functionally different trees. Yes. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. Uh, other questions about uh, decision trees? Yes. So in that case, it would only be like, uh, change the ordering will be minus. Right. So, okay, this is a good segue into the next thing that we are going to talk about, which is the ID3 algorithm. So the ID3 algorithm is a greedy heuristic. There are numerous trees that agree with the data. We need to find some way of choosing one of them. The ID3 algorithm is a heuristic that tries to find a shorter tree, a smaller tree, that agrees with the data. And because ID3 is deterministic, it will find the same tree. It will find one tree, the only sort of variation is the ordering of the, of the children. But that is like irrelevant because it's really a set, the order doesn't matter there. Uh, so the ID3 algorithm is a heuristic that explores the set of uh, the, the hypothesis space in a greedy fashion. In other words, it does not explore the entire hypothesis space. It just constructs a node, the, the root node, 
and then recursively calls the next one. And once the, the, the recursively calls itself for partitions of the data, and uh, once the child nodes are fixed, it does not ever go back and say, oh, you know what? I should have chosen this other root node. So it does not, there is no backtracking. Uh, so there is greedy search with no backtracking. That's what I did. Uh, at a high level, the ID3 algorithm is, uh, uh, it's a rather simple uh, algorithm, despite what you might uh, claim after your homework one. It's rather simple. If all, If your entire data has the same label, the 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 goal is the ID3 algorithm will produce a tree with exactly one node, which is just the label. Otherwise, it finds the best attribute to split on, the most informative attribute to split on, and then splits the data for different values that that feature takes. And now you get the partitions of the data. So you've essentially taken the root node and created all those branches. You have all the partitions of the data, and then you call the ID3 algorithm recursively on each of those partitions and just attach the resulting tree. Okay, the I have a most about interesting ID3. part uh, was someone. Oh, there's a question on ID3. Unfortunately, the class can't hear you. Maybe you can either type it. Can you type it? Yeah, I'll type it. Oh, maybe you can. Um, let's see. Okay, am I audible? I don't know. Can people hear this? Can you say something? Am I audible? Kind of faintly. So why don't you ask the question and I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, all right. So in the ID3 algorithm, um, once you, uh, you know, when you are going down the step where you pick a value of for all values V A, you add a branch with attribute A value V to root, and then you partition on that at on the various values of that attribute. Uh, so if a particular partition has a uh, you know, if a particular partition is an empty set, what do you do? Okay, so like okay, you can see what I've written here, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the question was, so in the ID3 algorithm, you have a, uh, you let's say you found that feature A is the best to split on, and feature A takes three values. So I created three branches, and when A takes the value v1, you get some set of the data. Let's call this v1. Uh, some partition, when A takes the value V2, you get another partition D2. And it just so happens that in the training data you have, um, A never took the value V3. So it's an empty set. What do you do? That's the question, right? So there are a few options here, but the most one of the most reasonable things to do is you do not, first of all, you do not ignore that feature. It is entirely possible that in the future, when this tree will actually be used, you will encounter an example where A takes the value V3. So you need to let your tree do something. So then the question is, what's the best thing to do when A takes the value V3? Well, you can think about what is the least bad thing to do when A takes the value V3. You have a data set here. The original data is D1 union D2, right? It had uh, both the D1 examples and the D2 examples and the empty set. You can ask, what is the uh, most common label in that entire set? And just decide, let's say the most common label in that set is the label plus. You just put the label plus here. And the reason this is not particularly bad is because imagine that you're not sitting at the root of a tree, but this particular call to ID3, there's like stuff coming on top. So there is uh, the tree is, uh, the, this feature A has been picked somewhere in a recursive call. Which means there's a whole bunch of features. We have an example in the future where A takes the value V3, but there are other features that agree with that entire path that took us down to A. So in some sense, this example is like all these examples here as far as all the other features are concerned, like everything above A. And so you use those examples and you pick the label that is the most common among those, in some sense, the most similar examples. And that way, your the hope is you don't uh, uh, you don't make a mistake. You, you make fewer mistakes than necessary. Does that make sense? Does that uh, answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions about the mechanics of the algorithm? Yes. Uh, 
So the ID3 algorithm is a batch algorithm. Okay, so then that question is interesting. Send me a message. Send the message to all of us. Um, okay, so the question, send a message on uh, the discussion board. Um, the ID3 algorithm is a batch algorithm. So the definition of a batch algorithm is uh, does it process the entire data at once? Uh, as opposed to processing or uh, the contrast here is online algorithms, which process examples one at a time. Question? So I saw on the video again, the variance of transparency based measures. Yes. And I'm wondering, what would the community do? What would that have minimized every single variance you've seen in class? Because some of them have more of a gross algorithm that will get much No, so the, the really, I don't want you to memorize those things no i want you to know that if, if if for example i'm going to ask you about a variant of the thing i'll give you the kind of information that i gave you in your homework uh whatever the homework the decision tree homework but you need to know how a variant of entropy might be used uh in the id3 algorithm in that scaffolding yes so the IID property shows up when you're talking about PAC, primarily for helping with analysis. We don't, so when we are given a data set, we make no assumptions about whether it's IID or not. We just, we can run our algorithm. So we can always run the batch algorithm on any data. But if you want to analyze it, and if you want to have PAC guarantees in particular, then you make the assumption that it, the data is not IID. So there's a difference, right? You can run your code on anything. Whether it works or not is a different question. All right, uh, since we spoke about the variance of the information uh, gain metric, let's move on. Uh, there are a few practical things you need to know about decision trees. In particular, that the, the idea that decision trees can easily overfit data set. The ID3 algorithm can easily overfit a data set because you can always keep partitioning your uh, data into smaller and smaller groups such that the only sort of reason to partition is actually not any signal but noise in the data. So you might end up overfitting to the noise in the data. And you need to know what are some strategies for dealing with overfitting with uh, decision trees. The One of the more robust strategies and perhaps the one that gets used all the time is uh, the idea that you prune a tree. You build a tree and then you kind of make sorry you not prune a tree you have a depth limited tree you don't even grow the tree all the way you just uh, uh let you have a depth limit and you if the if the number of recursive calls becomes more than that you stop growing the tree and pick the most common label something else you need to be comfortable with is how to deal with missing features with uh, the id3 with the decision tree sort of data uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but there are several heuristics that we discussed in class. And something that maybe is not necessarily an obvious thing for the midterm, but uh, something that I would like you to get a, get a sense of is when do you use decision trees? What kinds of, what does a decision tree give you that other learning algorithms, other classifiers do not? One obvious advantage of using a decision tree is that it gives you an interpretable model. Unlike a linear classifier, which, or uh, as we will see, other types of models that are more complicated, uh, a decision tree is easily interpretable because in order to get to the label, you have answered a sequence of questions that took you to the label. So if I ask you why is the label plus, you can say because this was this feature was yes, this feature was no, and so on. And other uh, learn other classifiers don't have that property. So decision trees are Fantastic if you want an interpretable model that is trained from scratch as being an interpretable model. For other classifiers, you have to add interpretability as a extra add-on with a lot of effort. We didn't cover this in the class, but I think this is important to uh, just know. All right, after that, we move to linear classifiers. So you need to know what linear classifiers are and why they are interesting. Well, they're interesting because they can represent a whole bunch of different kinds of functions. On the other hand, um, not all functions are linearly separable uh, because some functions are just uh, in the feature space that you have, 
those functions cannot be the, a single line cannot or a hyperplane does not separate the positive and the negative classes. So you need to have uh, in your mind like stock examples of functions that are and that are not linearly separable. It's useful uh, in this exercise to also keep in mind the geometry of a linear classifier. Uh, the geometry of a linear classifier is rather simple. It's a line, as the name suggests, or a plane or a hyperplane. In high dimensional space, in D dimensional, when you have D features in the D dimensional space, the linear classifier can be seen as a surface that slices through that feature space. And one side is positive, the other side is negative. And that's like a neat geometric interpretation. And it's worth keeping this in mind when you're thinking about whether certain functions are linearly separable or not. It's also worth keeping in mind when you're thinking about it because uh, uh, you might, that might give you some ideas for whether certain data sets are linearly separable or not. If, for example, and should I go into that example? Um, we have time. So I'll just do, uh, so imagine that uh, you are, uh, you are in the world of uh, um, in pre-Newtonian physics or pre-Newtonian world where we do not know Newton's law of gravitation. And I don't know if you remember, um, the, but if you, the force between two masses is directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them, square of the distance between them. Now, imagine that someone came to you, let's say Sir Isaac Newton came to you and said, you're a machine learning expert. I have this data set consisting of masses and distances and forces. Don't ask me how I measure it, but I took great pains and a lot of money. I got this data. And uh, I have a table that looks like M1, M2, R, and let's say instead of F, I have some other metric, whether the, the, the object that's orbiting either goes in or flies out or remains in orbit. So three, three classes, so orbit. So this is your data set. And the question now is to find something that looks like this functional relationship. In this case, even if you suspect slightly that the relationship between the target here and the features is not a linear one. In this case, it is clearly not linear. It is the product of M1 and M2 divided by R square is not a linear, it's not something that looks like A times M1 plus B times M2 plus C times R plus B. No function of this kind can approximate this. So there is no value in uh, using this sort of a plus this sort of a model to approximate that data. So if you have uh, you know the, if you have any sort of intuition about how your features interact with your target, and if you believe that that those features interact with your target in a way that's not linear, then your linear model is not going to work. Linear classifier or linear regressor. You might say this is like the Isaac Newton example is just made up. So I have actually encountered this both in my research and in fact, uh, in some class project where there was some, there is some task that I was working on uh, many years ago where looking at some linguistic evidence suggested that the, the label depended on the interaction between three different terms. So like a, a polynomial of degree three. And it just so happened that uh, because we were busy and uh, we were not thinking too hard about the problem, we just trained a linear classifier on all those terms and we never were able to replicate a paper. After a fair bit of effort, we realized that, oh, you know what? That paper is implicitly using these cubes, cubic terms, whereas we were using linear. So we always got a worse classifier. And literally adding a cube, all these cubic interactions, polynomial interactions gave us as good results as were published before. In a class project, there was a student who wanted to, uh, this was when I allowed arbitrary class projects, not like this competitive thing. There was a student who built, wanted to build a phone app that you can put on top of your car when it's running and based on the vibrations and the accelerometer readings, it will decide whether your engine needs to be tuned or not, which is such a cool thing. Uh, turns out that uh, that student was, uh, was uh, uh, I think he had a company that was doing this and they had some heuristics and it was okay, but not great. And he was hoping that he could use machine learning to make it better. 
His, he, it turned out he used gathered all these sensor readings and nothing ever worked as good as his heuristic. When we sat down and looked at the problem, it turns out all his heuristics had uh, like sinusoidal terms. Of course, you cannot approximate sin x with a times x. So all we did was took his features and added sinusoid, the, the, you know, transformed the features into the sine. I'm just making up sine. I don't remember if it was sine, it was some crazy function. We added all those terms and then gave it to the model and suddenly he got results that were way better than what his heuristics could do. It turns out that the underlying function did have these interactions, but it had all these constants that he could not find through heuristics and the data was able to fix it. So anyway, yes. So this question, what function would be linear classifier to express? Like, how would you answer that? Right? Because pretty much that's the information about features. Excellent question. This question was, uh, with, yes, that's that's a very good point. Any function can be seen as linearly separable as a linear classifier if you allow feature expansion. So this was supposed to be with no feature expansion. But of course, with that's a that's a very insightful point. In with the right feature transformation, any function is linearly separable. I can write, you know, I can create a crazy uh, a function, and you'll say the feature transformation is that function itself. Then it's linearly separable. So this is with in in the given that you are not making any transformations in the feature. Questions about uh, just uh, the, any of these things. Yes. Yeah, I have a follow-up question. So it seems that this kind of expansion has been important before we try to do Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the right sort of features, if you get the right sort of features, yes. learning is extremely easy. Right. If you have the right feature space, the problem of learning from data is essentially solved. But getting the right feature space is a non-trivial problem. So there are two ways to go about it. One of them is you think hard about the problem and think about the underlying mechanics of the problem. Think about the physics or whatever you want. And maybe you get some insight about the nature of the problem. You invent new features. That is doable, except it's also pretty hard. You need a lot of expertise. The other approach, which is actually the most common approach today, is to convert that into a learning problem. So I have my original features. I construct very, very simple feature, original data. I construct very, very simple features out of it. I don't put any thought into what the features should be. I think of the simplest features. And then I have another function that converts my data into a feature representation that an eventual, the final linear classifier can correctly classify. This other function that does this is a multi-layer neural network. The whole thing together is a multi-layer neural network. The last layer of a multi-layer neural network is often is basically a linear classifier. Everything that comes below that is learning feature representations. The importance of this, this the importance of the idea of learning representations cannot be understated. The, one of the biggest conferences in machine learning in the last decade uh, was created only in 2013. And this is called International Conference on Learning Representations, ICLR. It has become the de facto neural network conference, one of the two or three big uh, uh, machine learning conferences, because if you knew the right representation, machine learning is easy. Uh, if you knew the right representation, I could just, you know, the rest of the machine learning class is going to be much simpler. Other questions? Okay. Uh, the linear classifier itself is something that looks like the, in, at least in the binary case, it's a function that looks like sine of W transpose X plus B, where B is a bias term. B is a term that does not multiply itself with any feature. Uh, it's just a constant that's added to the score, to the dot product. Now, you should know what happens if we do not have the bias term. If you do not have the bias term, you will end up with just sine of W transpose X. I'll write this in two dimensions. In 2D, this is, uh, let me move these things around. 
So in two dimensions, this may be something like W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus B. There's a sign here. Here it's just sign of W1 X1 plus W2 X2. So if you do not have the bias term, what you're saying is that you believe for reasons that maybe are right. Your hyperplane that separates the data, the positive and the negative classes, passes through the origin. Look at that expression there. If without the B term, that's the equation of a line in two dimensions that goes through the origin. So if you have x1 and x2, we have some line that looks like that or a rotated version of that. So that's pretty much the only kind of functions that we can express. So you may have classifiers of this kind, classifiers of this, but you will never be able to, this expression will never be able to support a classifier of this kind because it does not, it's not a line that goes to the origin. So adding a bias term increases the expressiveness of the classifier. There's a question about uh, LTU. Why is the W uh, transposed? Why is it not just stored as a transpose shape so that we could, this is, okay, let me read out the question and then tell you about uh, why, I, why I write it this way. The question was, why does the W need to be transposed? Why isn't it just stored as a transposed shape so that we could take the dot product of w and x directly so in other words let me write this because this is a matter of convention and i i, I always write w transpose x the way to interpret this is i have a vector w that looks like this i have another vector x that looks like this i cannot take the dot product of these two objects uh two column vectors because that doesn't make sense instead i first transpose the w so this is w this is x Instead, I transpose the W to get this, and then I multiply it with the vector X, so I get a number. The question was, why am I always writing W transpose X? Why can't I just store the W as this row vector? This is a row vector, this is a column vector, as a row vector, and that way I can just, in a world where W was just a row vector, and this is just X, I could just write W times X. Um, this is just a habit that I built over the years. You don't need to copy that habit. In fact, there is there are software packages where they make this kind of an assumption where the uh, weights are stored as row vectors, the inputs are column vectors. I can tell you the reason I, why I made this habit. Uh, it's mostly as like a memory device for myself to remind me that this is a vector. These are both vectors. Um, I don't put arrows on top of this like we are supposed to. Um, so I just want to kind of have a very uh, visual, an easy visual way of looking at it and saying, oh, this is a vector. It's just a convention. Um, you can completely ignore that convention and write it as W is a row vector and X is a column vector. And you can just take the dot product of them without any effort. Another thing that I've also seen, another convention, which is equally good, which I just didn't uh, end up picking up, is you can write the dot product using this notation, W this is the dot product of two vectors. It makes it very clear that these two are vectors. Sometimes, I don't know why the, this notation, some people have never encountered in their life. And so I just stopped using it after a point. So it's, it's just a matter of convention. Going back to the bias term. So you need to know what the bias term is and you need to understand what this feature transformation does. We sp spoke about feature transformation. Uh, basically what it does is given an input in, in a feature space, the feature transformation warps around the feature space and basically bends it around so that data becomes linearly separable. Um, I usually have an example involving a sheet of paper. Let's see if I can find the sheet of paper that, oh, this looks like an example. So let's not do this. Um, so, Basically, you're warping around the space so that points that are not close to each other become the same. And that way you can kind of bend the space around so that a line separates it. Uh, the, the example that I have, oh man, I, I really like that example, so I can't, uh, who carries paper anymore? It doesn't matter, so we are not going to do this. Um, any questions about linear classifiers or, yes? Yes, 
So yes and no. So the weights can be matrices. Imagine that the weights are matrices and you have, I, I like drawing boxes rather than, uh, so imagine that you have a matrix and a vector. So let's say you have M cross N and N cross one. So the result is M cross one when you multiply them. This is a natural way for doing building a linear classifier if you have multi-class classification, where you have n classes and you want one score for each label, and you pick the label that has the highest score. So when you have multi-class classification, the weights become matrices. With binary classification, ideally the weights should be a matrix with two rows, but uh, we don't need to because we only need one of them, one of those rows because if that is not the highest, the other one's the highest. So uh, if what I just said did not make sense, let's just uh, kind of go back. And weight matrices are commonly used for multi-class classification. Uh, inputs, if you want to make them matrices, that does not give you too much by way of, uh, uh, by it does not change too many things for you because you can always stack the columns and get a vector. So, it's not very commonly done. Parameters can also be other things. The weights can be vectors or matrices. They could also be tensors that are higher shapes. You know, I I went from a line to a square here. I could also create an object that is three-dimensional or four-dimensional, and they tend to feature inside neural networks, which we will get to later. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Why is it important to classify why wx as a mistake sorry ah okay uh, i'll come uh, grace i'll come to your question uh, when we talk about the perceptron algorithm is that okay i think that's a uh, that's a good question which i know that i messed up when i spoke about it in class so i will come to that okay this is a good segue into mistake bond learning so we, we looked at mistake bond learning it's one of the many ways of asking the question, how good is your learning algorithm? And uh, gender, a generalization of the mistake-driven model, uh, mistake-driven learner is something called the online learn. The online learning, every online learning algorithm essentially has the same sort of a template. The learner maintains an internal uh, uh, model that it keeps updating. At, any, at uh, each step, it receives an example, then it makes a prediction using its current model. And then after it uh, makes the prediction, it receives feedback about the prediction. And if based on the feedback, it can choose to correct its model. A mistake driven learner is a specific instance of that where the correction happens when there's a mistake. A general online learner might correct itself even when there's no mistake, but maybe the, the model is making a prediction with low confidence or something like that. So it can increase the confidence. A mistake-driven learner makes a correction when there's a mistake. This is the sort of a recipe for all, this is the sort of a structure of all mistake-driven algorithms. There are really only two things that you need to specify to define a mistake, uh, three things really. You need to specify to define a mistake-driven uh, learner. One of them is, what is the current model? What is the model that it maintains? The second one is, how does it make a prediction? In fact, you don't even need to say what the model it maintains is, uh, if you can say unambiguously how the system makes a prediction. And if there's a mistake, the other thing you need to specify is how it makes a correction. So if you can write down these pieces of uh, information, you would have defined a full mistake-driven learner. This is just a general recipe for a learner but we also defined a specific notion of a mistake bound algorithm. This was a formal definition, which says that no matter which sequence of examples are presented, no matter how the sequence of examples are presented to the learner, no matter which function in a set of functions is the true function, the, the, that set of functions is said to be mistake bound learnable if only after making a polynomial number of mistakes, the learner stops making mistakes. The concept class itself is said to be mistake bound learnable if that happens. The algorithm which instantiates that, namely it makes only a polynomial number of mistakes, 
and and guarantees that there will be no more mistakes such an algorithm is called a mistake bound uh, learning algorithm now of course i can define whatever i want does not mean that there those things have to exist it turns out mistake bound algorithms exist and there are a couple of we looked at a proof of concept so we looked at these two algorithms con and having neither of these are guaranteed to be mistake bound algorithms because the mistake bound algorithm remember needs to make a polynomial number of mistakes in the number of features so you need to know for con and having how many mistakes they make in terms of the size of the concept class not necessarily in, the number, in terms of number of features but then use the so let's so both of these you can ask number of mistakes in terms of the size of c you should be, and we work through the proof of this and you should be able to prove but the size of c is not what matters for the mistake for an algorithm to be a mistake bound you need to be polynomial in the dimensionality that i'm calling n here so you need to somehow be able to connect the size of the the the, the you need to state what is the number of functions in a concept class as a function of this dimensionality so in order to apply these uh, the the result that of these uh, the, not the result from these algorithms result about these algorithms you you need to be able to apply the result about these algorithms for finite hypothesis class what that entails is counting how many functions there are in a set of uh, in a in a function class um, this exercise allows you to show that certain functions are learnable and certain functions are not learnable and while i say that some functions and uh, are learnable and not learnable that is not a complete statement it is learnable under this model under the mistake bound model certain function classes cannot be learned under the mistake bound model certain function classes can be learned and that's the kind of statement that we can make questions about this yes for a uh, for a finite concept class the having algorithm makes the optimum number of mistakes what that means is that no matter what other algorithm you invent it will not make it will make at least as many mistakes as having so it's like a, a, a and this is the worst case so no matter what other algorithm you invent the worst case number of mistakes cannot get lower than the worst case of having other questions if not um we're going to talk about the perceptron algorithm we spent a fair bit of time looking at the perceptron algorithm it's a really neat algorithm the original perceptron algorithm which is from 1958 is rather simple it uh given an example i i it's a it's a mistake driven algorithm so i just need to say how predictions are made and how updates are made so prediction is made using so the, the perceptron learn algorithm learns a weight vector uh, w and i'm not going to show the bias term but always remember there is a bias term because i have put it into the feature vector so the prediction is made using w transpose x and the sign of that and if that's positive or negative and if the ground truth disagrees uh the update is the famous perceptron update which is w is w plus r times y x where y is the label which can be minus 1 or 1 and x is the feature vector and this is now this takes us to the question that came up why is i could have written instead of writing these two steps if i wrote them as an algorithm that would be something like if sign of w transpose x is not equal to y then w is w plus r times y x and this is your the entire algorithm and there's a loop over example the question was why did i say that if, if instead of taking the sign of this i could say if y times w transpose x is less than equal to 0 then w is w plus r y x so these two are equivalent and i spent a bit of time saying why these two are equivalent um 
I don't think I need to go over that again. I hope not, unless someone wants to. I saw one head nodding no, and I'm going to take that as a representative of the entire class. Um, unless there are heads nodding yes. Now heads are not moving at all. Okay. Um, okay, but the question was not that. The question was, uh, uh, at some point I said, there you could have also done if y w transpose x is strictly less than zero, then w is w plus r y x. And I said, don't do this because it can cause problems. And the reason is, depends on your initialization. Imagine that you initialize your weight vector w to the zero vector. So your initial weight vector is zero, and then this is uh, looped over and over again. Now, let's consider the first example. So the first example, let's say, is x1, whose label is y1. Now, the sign, now I could ask, what is w transpose x? Which is because w is zero, w transpose x is zero, x1 is zero. Now, the sign of that quantity, sign of w transpose x1 is plus of w transpose x1 is plus because the sign of zero is plus. If the first example that you encountered had a negative label, this would be an update, this would trigger an update and your algorithm will move along. If it is positive, well, there's no mistake, so why bother? So that's fine. On the other hand, let's consider, let's give these things names. Let's call this the algorithm A, this is B and C. With B, what happens is W transpose X is zero, which means Y times W transpose X is also zero, which means it's strictly, it's less than or equal to zero, which means there will be an update. So the first example will trigger an update. So this is for B. With C, what happens is Y times W transpose X is equal to zero and not less than zero, which means it will not update. So you will not update the W and W will remain zero again. Next example comes along. Y times W transpose X is still zero because you didn't update the W. It is not less than zero, so no update. W will remain the same. So basically, no matter how many in in examples you encounter, this condition will never be false, which means you will never update. On the other hand, with this, with just the first example, you will force an update, and then the algorithm will move on. Does that uh, answer your question, Grace? OK. Um, other questions or comments. One of the other things that you need to learn about, uh, kind of understand, oh, I should not have cleared the whole thing. But uh, one of the things that you should uh, kind of intuitively have a, a feeling for is what is the geometry of the perceptron update? The perceptron algorithm is learning a linear classifier, which means the geometry of the update essentially changes the linear classifier. Uh, so the update changes the linear classifier. We know what the geometry of the linear classifier was. It's a hyperplane in the high dimensional space, or it's a line. Maybe it's a line that looks like this. And what the perceptron algorithm does is, assuming that there's no bias term, it just keeps rotating the line so that the 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 resulting line better uh, is not directly better, but is assigns a higher value of W transpose X times Y the next time around, if you encounter the same example. So from this, maybe you move to something that looks like this, or maybe you move from here to something that looks like this. So essentially it's rotating the line if you do not have a bias term. If you had a bias term, it rotates the line and also moves it around in the space. There are many, many variants of the perceptron algorithm. You need to know about the margin perceptron and the average perceptron and general rule of advice. If you are ever using perceptron in, in uh, you know, in the wild, I would highly encourage you to just use the average perceptron. It just seems to give like a 2% improvement, uh, one or 2% improvement for free. So why not take it? Uh, an important concept that, uh, that comes into play for the first time in this class with the perceptron is this idea of a margin. The margin of a classifier. What you should know what the margin of a classifier is and why it's important. And in particular, you need to know how it connects to this uh, the the Novikov theorem or the Novikov block theorem, which is basically the perceptron mistake bound theorem. You need to know the uh, not the algorithm but theorem. 
you need to know what's the intuition behind the theorem uh, and its proof. And you should be able to apply the proof to variants of this algorithm, say, for example, the margin perceptron. Questions? Yes. Not really, no. Uh, you should know how the proof works. Uh, I don't know how else I can say that. I mean, how do you learn theorems and proofs in general? I don't want you to memorize it. I want you to understand it. You know, there's a difference, right? Um, if you memorize it, then you'll not be able to generalize it. Questions? Any other questions? There have to be questions. Yes. Yeah. So what the margin perceptron does is, uh, remember we in the, the update that we had was y times w transpose x is less than or equal to zero. If this happens, then update. What the margin perceptron says is, it's not enough if uh the, the the update is triggered when y w transpose x is less than zero but it should be less than some number eta and eta is a positive number now what that means is there are a few different regimes here when y times w when y w transpose x let's call this the score if the score is negative we know there's a mistake because it's less than zero so we should have an update what the, uh, by adding this extra margin term, you're saying it's not enough if the score is negative. If the score is positive, but really a small number, I want you to enforce this margin of safety because I don't want the weight vector to be that close to an example. So make an update anyway. So an example of where this might happen in the, in, uh, if, as a proof by picture, imagine you have this weight vector that says this side is positive and you get this example here. It's really close to the uh, the hyperplane, and maybe your eta is something like this gap, this band. Eta represents this width here. This is eta. So your, what the margin perceptron says is, it's not enough if the positive example is on the right side of the margin. It should be outside the sorry. It's, it's not enough if the the positive example is on the right side of the hyperplane. It should be outside the margin. If it's inside the margin, I would still count it as a mistake and make an update. And what maybe what will happen is as a result of this update, the weight vector might maybe rotate a bit like this. Oh, no, maybe a bit like this. And the new margin might be something like this so that the, so the, the, the example is outside. So what the margin gives you is uh, it allows you to think of your separator not as an infinitely thin line, but as like a block. And you're saying that I don't want any straining examples to lie within that sort of a band. I was looking at the slide for this. It's just more cat water. I, is that a, I don't understand. I use the letter R all the time. Okay, there's one algorithm in the capital R. That's uh, the no epoch theorem. And in the slide, it said that R squared is 10 for the class. Yes. Yes. How did you start that? Ah, so the question was, so let me just tell you, define the state what R is. R is the, uh, is a, a real number, a positive number, such that for every example xi, which is a vector, the size of xi or the length of that vector is less than r or less than or equal to r, right? It's any such number that satisfies the property. It makes sense to kind of find the smallest such number. Now let's consider Boolean functions. Let's consider the functions in two dimensions first. If you have two dimensional Boolean functions, you have these four points. Now, what is the farthest? So the way to think about this R is this is the radius of a circle that contains all the data points, but and is centered at the origin because you're looking at the uh, uh, the absolute value of the space. So that circle might look something like this. I can't draw something like that. Wow, what a bad circle. You, you know what I'm talking about. I hope you do. This point should not lie there.
And that's wow. <laughs> I'm not very drawn to them. Um, there's a story involving Archimedes about that, but we won't go there. Um, the radius of this circle is what? If assuming that this is one one, what? One, which is just root two, right? So in this case, r square is two. You have two dimensions, r square is two. Okay, what do you have? What if you have three dimensional points? What's the farthest point from the origin in three dimensions? If you have a Boolean cube. No, what's the farthest point? This is the farthest point. The, the farthest point is all ones. And the distance of all ones from all zeros is, you know what I'm doing. So it's basically you get uh, uh, three here and n. And square root of n is the uh, distance, this is the radius of the circle. So r square is the base. There's a question on. Uh, on uh, Zoom, is the margin of a data set the farthest data point in the data set because that's the margin of the worst hyperplane? The margin, the margin of a data set is not the farthest data point. It is given a set of points like this. Let's say that this perfectly separates the pluses and the minuses. So let's say this is a plus and this is a minus. The margin of this data set is you consider all possible linear separators. Let's call these. A, B. So you now ask, what is the closest data point to that linear separator? Assuming that it perfectly classifies the data. So in this case, for A, the closest data point might be this, and the distance would be something like this distance here. For B, maybe it's this thing here, and for C, it is this thing here. And the margin of the data set is you try out every possible hyperplane, and the one that puts the biggest gap between it and any other data point is the one that gives you the margin and that distance is the margin. Um, there is a little bit more and I'm not going to talk about the formal definition yet. Uh, I want to kind of reserve the that for when we get to support vector machines. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit more formally. Okay, we have only three minutes left. Yes. Even that data is totally separable and you don't have noise. That's right. The, the theorem only works. The theorem states if your data is linearly separable, then the perceptron algorithm will find a linear separator after making a finite number of mistakes. In particular, R square over gamma square number of mistakes. This means the perceptron algorithm can only work, uh, the theorem only applies if the data is linearly separable. Yes. Okay, uh, we have two minutes left, and I want to at least go through my slides well, for what they are worth. Um, we talked about least mean square regression and linear regression. Uh, you need to know what it is. You need to, the, we touched upon a really, really important uh, idea for the first time in this lecture when we talk about this, which is the idea of learning by minimizing a loss function or a cost function. And uh, for the first time in the class, in the semester, we looked at the uh, the 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 idea of learning by optimizing a function. So we looked at two optimization algorithms, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. You need to know what the difference is between them and how they apply. Finally, we talked of we uh, most recently looked went into computational learning theory. Uh, we didn't complete this unit, so uh, you won't get very difficult questions from here. Uh, also because you've, you've not done a homework on this, so you've not had time to kind of let it kind of sink in. But I want to kind of quickly touch upon the things that we've uh, looked at. Um, there is the driving assumption for fact theory, at least the way it was originally introduced, which is training examples and future examples where the models will be tested are all drawn from, uh, uh, from the same distribution. The distribution is fixed, but possibly unknown. And you need to understand, this is important. You need to know what's the difference between back learning and online learning. Back, the back model of learning works because it allows us to make, it, it concedes two things. It concedes the, uh, the uh, expectation that we will get a perfect, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get the true concept perfectly. The learner is allowed to make a close approximation of the true concept, but not necessarily a perfect uh, copy. So we are allowing an epsilon error. 
In addition, we are also conceding the fact that sometimes we might just be unlucky and learning might fail because we just have a bad data set. And that's the delta. So that's the guarantee that learning will succeed. And these are the two complexity parameters that uh, the PAC uh, model of learning uh, is, um, uh, is defined. So you need to know what the definition of PAC learning is and what's efficient PAC learning. And these two important concepts of sample complexity and computational complexity of a learning algorithm. Sample complexity is essentially saying, how many data points do I need in order to satisfy these guarantees with the epsilon and delta? What guarantees? The guarantee that with high probability, with probability more than one minus delta, the learning algorithm will succeed in give, producing a classifier whose error is less than epsilon. So sample complexity is asking how many examples you need for, 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 to give that guarantee. The last thing we looked at was uh, uh, Occam's razor for consistent uh, learners. We didn't complete this, but the main point here really is that uh, it, it, we ended up proving a theorem called Occam's razor that said the sample complexity uh, is dependent on the size of the hypothesis class. So we are back to this idea of counting the size of the hypothesis class. Given a function set of functions, you need to know how many functions there are. And this is something that you also did with the mistake bound model, and you'll be doing with this also. We didn't complete the positive and negative results, so I'm not going to talk about that. 